Oye! 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 Ladies, gentlemen, good citizens of Alexandria within the sound of my voice. Be it known that we gather here on this mid-July date when Virginia colonists penned a document to challenge the British authority which made them irate. This act inspired the fight for independence and the British Empire in America it will dissolve. For on this date, we commemorate the 250th of the Fairfax Resolve. Today we celebrate this document and the brave colonists who dared to speak their mind and Virginia's role in the American Revolution as the two are so entwined. You see, the document that the Georges, Washington and Mason inked, set Alexandria and the quest for independence to be forever linked. Today, we will place a marker to acknowledge this bold action that helped the idea of fighting for a new nation gain traction. What began with a dumping of tea in the Boston Harbor led to the dissolution of the House of Burgesses by the Earl of Dunmore. As you see, you can imagine the people of Virginia could not let this stand. And the flames of discontent were soon predictably fanned. So thoughts were put to paper in such a persuasive way that the citizens of Fairfax County voted approval of the resolves we celebrate today. Therefore, as the town crier for the city of Alexandria, I welcome you here on this momentous occasion. Whether you are of Alexandria, Fairfax, or any Virginia persuasion, God bless Alexandria and these United States. Good evening. My name is Gretchen Bulova. I'm the director of Historic Alexandria. And thank you for joining us on this gift of a July evening. I know it's still a little warm, but it's far better than it was last week. Uh, we do have water for you over in these coolers. Please help yourself. And if you need a program, uh, individuals are circulating, so please make sure you have one of these to follow along. And I would like to point out that before you leave tonight, the Fairfax County History Commission, the first booth over here, has pocket Fairfax resolves to, for everyone here tonight. So please make sure you take one of those as well. I'd like to first uh, begin by thanking the Sons of the American Revolution for their color guard and our amazing town crier, Ben Fury Walker. <laughs> the adoption of the Fairfax Resolves took place on this site on July 18, 1774, then the site of the Fairfax court system. Alexandria was selected as the location for the Fairfax Courthouse starting in 1752 because of its growing port and center of trade. The courthouse then moved to the center of Fairfax County in 1800 when Alexandria became part of the new federal city of Washington. The Fairfax Resolves were part of a wave of resolutions throughout Virginia and the other colonies in response to the coercive acts enacted by Parliament in early 1774 in retaliation to the December 13, 1773 Boston Tea Party. The idea of representative government was being challenged. The Fairfax Resolves, authored in large part by George Mason at the request of George Washington, were the most aggressive of the resolves passed in Virginia, recognized as the most detailed, the most influential, and most radical. You will hear and learn more about the boldness of the Fairfax Resolves through our program today. Um, so first of all, from the City Council, we have our Vice Mayor, Amy Jackson. 
We have Councilman John Taylor Chapman. My predecessor, former Mayor Allison Silberberg. Where did she go? Over there. We have our city manager, Jim Parajan, over there. Thank you so much to our color guard uh, for getting us started and uh, our incredible town crier, Ben Fiore Walker. Um, as Ben and I were talking about earlier, uh, normally uh, he does not fit in with the predominant attire. This is one of those events he actually uh, fits in uh, with, uh, with how everyone is generally dressed. So, uh, so we appreciate uh, his work always. Um, I want to thank uh, Ms. Fiorina for being here and being a part of this event, as well as your leadership in uh, this particular interpretation, but as well as your leadership in uh, historic interpretation around our Commonwealth all the time. So thank you for your work and your leadership. We appreciate it. You know, a couple days ago, we celebrated our uh, Alexandria's 275th birthday on Saturday um, down on the waterfront. And uh, we are in a festive mood this year and celebrating the uh, broad expanse of Alexandria's history. And we always like to note that our nation is a, a bit younger, our younger uh, nation um, than the city. We, we do, uh, like most things that are important and cool, we do them uh, before everyone else gets to them and then they figure them out and copy us. Um, but uh, we recognized uh, on Saturday our 275th anniversary, um, but we also recognize uh, that throughout our history and the history uh, of our nation, the history of our city, the history of our commonwealth has happened right here. It's happened on the streets of Alexandria. We uh, always cherish the fact that um, uh, on every street in this city, you can hear the footsteps of our history. But we recognize that history is cumulative. Um, all of our history, every, every point of our history builds on uh, what happened before it. And uh, this event that we are commemorating, the Fairfax Resolves, uh, 250 years ago today is uh, is a, an amazing example of of a foundational uh, 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 event, a, fa a seminal event from our history that builds uh, that is built on in so many different ways. Um, you know, you would not have a Declaration of Independence without uh, the Fairfax Resolves. Um, you would not have uh, the Constitution that ultimately uh, was was ratified and, and went into effect in 1787 without uh, the Fairfax Resolves, without um, the the strain. Of, uh, of history that you can trace through to the event that happened right here, right on this, uh, this spot. And as uh, Gretchen noted, um, this was a bold set of, uh, of, of, of requests. This was a bold set of demands that was included in this document. And to this day, you can go all around this planet and look to freedom-loving people yearning for additional freedoms, and they, you can trace it back to what happened here, what happened in the Fairfax Resolves, what ultimately uh, uh, led to the Declaration of Independence, and so much of our, of our history, and that continues today. And while we acknowledge that, uh, that, that uh, at the time in the Fairfax Resolves, um, the, uh, the plea for freedom, the plea for liberty, did not extend to everybody. Um, we know that throughout our history, we have continued to expand those freedoms, and we can point back to what happened here, what happened in the city of Alexandria right on this site. Um, I do have a proclamation on behalf of my colleagues uh, from the city council that I am going to read, and then I'm going to sit down. Whereas the United States of America in 2026 will mark 250 years since the Declaration of Independence from Britain. And whereas the American Revolution was a long and hard fought war, but it was more than a war. It was a revolution of ideas. And whereas Virginia's history is America's story, and whereas in response to the 1774 Boston Port Act adopted by the British Parliament, counties across Virginia responded with resolutions opposing what they viewed as overly harsh British rule. And whereas the Fairfax Resolves were issued from what was then the Fairfax County Courthouse, the site of today's Alexandria City Hall, much better name, I have to say, on July 18, 1774, and whereas representatives from Fairfax County, including George Washington and George Mason, and well-known Alexandrians such as John Carlisle, Charles Alexander, George Gilpin, and William Ramsey, supported the 26 resolves. And whereas the Fairfax resolves were among the most radical and influential precursors to what ultimately became the Declaration of Independence. And whereas, while the intention of the resolves applied to people like themselves, later generations used their words and ideas to demand those rights for all citizens. 
And whereas today, working in partnership with VA 250, our regional museums such as George Washington's Mount Vernon, George Mason's Gunston Hall, Carlisle House Historic Site, and other local organizations, the City of Alexandria, through the work of Historic Alexandria, is committed to sharing the full and diverse, rich history of our nation with all Alexandrians in this semi-quincentennial commemoration. Now, therefore, I, Justin and Wilson, Mayor of the City of Alexandria, Virginia, and on behalf of the Alexandria City Council and the citizens of Alexandria, do formally acknowledge the 250th anniversary of the Fairfax Resolves in the City of Alexandria. And I call this observance the attention of all of our citizens. In witness whereof, I have hereunto set my hand and caused the seal of the City of Alexandria to be affixed this 18th day of July, 2024. Thank you all very much for being here and being a part of this event. And congratulations to everyone who has played such an important role in planning it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And how about another round of applause for the Mayor of Alexandria? <laughs> Greetings, and thank you all for joining us on this important and special day in historic Alexandria. My name is Scott Stroh, and I proudly serve as Executive Director of George Mason's Gunston Hall. I'm also honored to serve on the VA 250 Commission and as Chair of the Fairfax County 250th Commission. In many ways, the foundation for today's celebration began back in 2018, when a large and diverse group of museum professionals and other citizens from around the Commonwealth first began thinking about the 250th of American independence coming up in 2026 which at that time seemed well off in the distant future. The found, this foundational work ultimately supported an effort to formally establish a Commonwealth Commission that would focus on leading 250th planning efforts on behalf of and for everyone in the Commonwealth of Virginia. In 2020, the American Revolution 250 Commission was signed into law, and this body, guided by the stated purpose of forming a more perfect union by educating Virginians about their history and civic duty, and sharing diverse narratives that capture Virginia's complete story and role in shaping the nation is presently and actively at work. The VA 250 Commission is also a partner and provided financial support for today's event, so please again join me in thanking the Commonwealth and the VA 250 Commission for their exceptional efforts in support of today and for the planning of the 250th in 2026. The tagline for the VA 250 Commission is that Virginia's history is America's story. I agree, and I think all of us here today would also agree that this expression is true. But as we gather in Alexandria on the anniversary of the Fairfax Resolves, I think it is also appropriate to suggest and say that Alexandria's and Fairfax County's history is Virginia's story. While we live in a diverse commonwealth characterized by inspiring stories representing, representative of the ideas that define our nation, ideas such as the inherent rights of life, liberty, and happiness, it is, it is in Alexandria and Fairfax County where the revolutionary movement was in many ways conceived and born. From our founders and revolutionary history through ensuing decades of struggle for human, civil, educational, and environmental rights, this area and its distinctive places, stories, and people embody this history. This region is also home to signature organizations championing these causes and telling these stories, like Historic Alexandria, Mount Vernon, Carlisle House, Gunston, ha Gunston Hall, and many more. Recognizing this history and the amazing histories of this area, as well as the diverse stories found in every corner of this city and surrounding county, Fairfax County was proudly the first jurisdiction in Virginia to establish its own 250th Planning Commission. But let us return to the ideas for just another brief minute. The ideas conceived, written, or read aloud in places such as where we are now gathered from documents such as the Fairfax Resolves and later in George Mason's Virginia Declaration of Rights were truly revolutionary in 1774 and 1776. These ideas were also not without contradiction, and it is important to acknowledge that as George Mason was writing and advocating for rights and freedoms, he also enslaved hundreds of individuals, none of whom he freed. This reality is part of the larger story that must also be told for us to fully understand our American Revolution and our quest for independence. Most importantly, these ideas are not bound by time, place, or person. They remain relevant today, and they have never been more important for us all to understand than they are right now. Finally, these ideas were expressed in 1776 as inherent rights, 
but also articulated in the form of a promise. And part of the power of this moment is the opportunity for us to come together and fulfill the promise of 1776 for everyone, everywhere. Thank you, and it is now my great honor to introduce the National Honorary Chair of the Virginia 250 Commission, Carly Fiorina. Chair Fiorina began her career as a secretary for a nine-person real estate firm. She climbed the corporate ladder at AT&T and Lucent Technologies through a willingness to tackle tough problems, a relentless focus on producing results and accepting responsibility, and a passion for leveraging the talents of others and building high-performance teams. She was recruited to Hewlett Packard with a mission to transform the company, and in so doing became the first woman to lead a Fortune 50 company. During her tenure as chair and CEO, Hewlett Packard became the largest technology company in the world. As a student of history and philosophy at Stanford University, Chair Fiorina first began to appreciate the power of ideas to drive positive change and impact the history on our present and our future. She believes that a deeper understanding of our nation's full history, as well as the ideas upon which America was founded, is particularly important during the current climate of division, discord, and political dysfunction. Chair Fiorina serves as chair of the Board of Trustees of the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation and as National Honorary Chair of the Virginia 250 Commission. In both roles, she is focused on ensuring that our nation's founding is broadly understood, accurately portrayed, and commemorated in an inclusive, accessible way, particularly as we approach the United States semi-quincentennial in 2026. Chair Fiorina and her husband Frank have been married for almost 40 years, and they live in Lorton, Virginia, where they are both active members of the community and support numerous local charitable causes. Please join me in welcoming an inspiring leader and passionate advocate for the importance of history, Carly Fiorina. And good evening. I am here not only as uh, the National Honorary Chair of VA 250, but also as a Virginian and frankly, as Scott mentioned, as a neighbor to both George Mason and George Washington, or at the least to Gunston Hall and Mount Vernon. My husband and I met and married here in Virginia. Our first home was not so very far from here. Our family is here, and 13 years ago, we moved back from California and bought a home less than two miles from where George Mason once lived. We look up the beautiful Potomac River at where he and George Washington together at Mount Vernon wrote the Fairfax Resolves. The resolves are long. I've read them all. These guys were not brief. <laughs> I picture the two Georges laboring together, or perhaps George Washington telling George Mason, you don't have it quite yet, go back. But I picture them laboring together to be complete in their list of complaints and their proposals and proposed protests that they would put forth for agreement here in Alexandria to their fellow Alexandrians, not far from where we stand tonight, as you've heard in 1774. Virginia has always been the crucible of our nation. Here in Virginia, indigenous peoples first saw tall ships carrying white men arrive. Here in Virginia, the first colonists settled, not in Plymouth Rock, thank you very much. The first ships carrying the enslaved landed here in Virginia. The first representative government met here in Virginia. The Revolutionary Army was mustered here and was, of course, commanded by the Virginian General Washington. The Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution were written by George Mason, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, Virginians all. Here in Virginia, from slave rebellions to abolition movements right through to the Civil War, from the imprisonment of suffragists, from voting rights to civil rights, and into the present day. Virginia has always been a crucible for great ideas, great conflicts, great debates, and eventually, great reconciliation and great progress. As the mayor proudly told you, Alexandria, founded 275 years ago, like the rest of Virginia, has also been a crucible for our nation. And in so many ways, our nation began here 
in Alexandria 250 years ago. The intercolonial movement towards independence began in so many ways here when George Washington and George Mason penned the resolves and then presented them to their fellow Virginians for their agreement. And those words, because they were persuasive, because they were powerful, changed all that came after. They issued a revolutionary call for colonists and colonies to come together and protest against British action they considered anti-American. They had the idea then of America. The Fairfax Resolves declare that we are not a conquered nation, that we cannot be governed by laws to which we did not consent, and that we will not be taxed without representation. Virginia has always been the crucible of our nation. Virginia is where our nation started. Virginia led the revolutionary movement. Virginia's history is indeed America's story. But why should we care? Why actually should we care? There are so many people who hear the word history and tune out. It's boring, it's not for us. Why should we care? Whenever any of our families gather for a special occasion, a reunion, a wedding perhaps, even a funeral, we all do the same thing. Inevitably, we get around to telling stories of our family's past. We tell the stories of those who came before us. Why? Why do we all do this? Because we realize at our core that unless we know who and where we come from, we do not know who we are. Unless we are rooted in our past, we are, as individuals, as families, we are unsettled in our present and we are uncertain about our future. My grandmother was a Virginian, although eventually she would marry and settle in Texas, where I was born. And when we would gather around her table, we would frequently tell the, some, the story of someone who made us very proud, J.P. Sneed. He was a circuit-riding preacher. He was tall and charismatic and full of rectitude. Over time, I would learn that there were other stories we didn't tell. Because we were ashamed or afraid or indifferent. And I learned what every family learns. We cannot heal until everyone's story is told. What is true for a family is true for a community, and it is true for our nation. History is never just in the past. It influences our present. It impacts our future. When history is told completely and accurately, then history is a mirror into which we look to see ourselves more clearly. Our nation is not founded on the basis of territory or ethnicity or religion. We are the only nation on the face of the planet and throughout all of human history founded instead on ideals, on guiding principles, on a system of government. When we do not tell Virginia's history and America's story. We do not know who we are and where we come from. We do not know what binds us together. We do not know why we are a nation. Lewis Burns, a great Osage Indian and historian, put it this way, what is gone is treasured because it is what we once were. We gather our past and our present into the depths of our being and face tomorrow. Our history teaches us that ideas change the world. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. A radical idea. The words of the Fairfax Resolves, the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, and the Constitution applied then only to white male property owners. The writers were all enslavers. And yet, these words, which took both great thought and great courage to write, 
brought radical ideas to life that have inspired every movement for human dignity, sovereignty, equality, and liberty everywhere ever since. We tend to look at history as a great sweep of events led by famous people, but we have the benefit of hindsight. The Fairfax Resolves began a movement towards independence that was incredibly risky. The British were wealthier, more powerful. Their army was better equipped. The political debates to forge a new nation were fraught and emotional, consensus elusive. The colonies were in fact bitterly divided over whether independence was heroic or treasonous. The outcome of the Revolutionary War was always in doubt until the very end when the British surrendered in Yorktown, Virginia. And so our history teaches us that people make the difference. At the time great movements begin, the outcome is anything but clear. Despite the risks and the uncertainties, the fears and the sacrifices, countless unsung heroes choose to commit. And when many choose to act, the world changes. We know George Mason, Thomas Jefferson, and James Madison. We know George Washington, and we say he won the war for independence. But that war was fought by people like Robert Mersch, a Pamunkey Indian, by Anna Marie Lane, our first female veteran, by Edmund Dickinson, who left a thriving furniture business by James Armistead, George Washington's slave, who became his spy and relayed vital information about British troop movements. These are Virginians you perhaps or maybe even probably have never heard of, and these Virginians changed the world. Virginia's history is America's story. 2026, as you now know, is our semi-quincentennial. I had to practice very hard to say that effectively and smoothly. Our semi-quincentennial, that is the 250th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And I have the great honor to serve as the National Honorary Chair. I, as a proud Virginian, know the nation began here. I am proud to serve because I believe we must learn who and where we come from to understand why we are Americans. I serve because I know that Virginians can make a difference to our future by what we choose from today through 2026 and beyond. Our goal on the commission is to educate every Virginian and all Americans about who we are and where we come from so that we understand why we are a nation. Our goal is to engage with every community and every locality so that we all see ourselves more clearly in our shared history and discover the empathy and the civility that comes from hearing someone else's story. Our goal is to inspire us all to recommit to citizenship. In America, citizens are sovereign, not kings, not presidents, not governments, not even mayors, citizens. We have rights and freedoms, but citizenship requires us to be committed, not passive. It is we as citizens who must choose to act in order to form a more perfect union. The people who have come before us throughout our almost 250 years as a nation chose to act, even when the odds were very long and the outcome uncertain. They chose to make change, to take risk, to make progress, to do their part to form a more perfect union. As Virginia led the movement toward independence, Virginia is once again leading the semi-quincentennial movement. Let us each, let us all, do our part and choose to act. Let us choose to educate ourselves about who we are and where we come from. Let us choose to engage with one another and learn each other's stories. Let us choose to become active citizens, to help form a more perfect union in our neighborhoods, in our communities, in our commonwealth, and in our nation. Because as our nation also teaches us, change always starts from the bottom up. 
Our history reminds us that change starts small and starts at home. As the Alexandrians who stood here 250 years ago resolved, let us also resolve that through our choices and through our actions, we can start a movement. We can build a better nation. We can form a more perfect union. Thank you for being here tonight. Let's give another round of applause for Carly Fiorina. Thank you so much. I warned her ahead of time that I might be crying after her remarks. So inspiring. My name is Allison Wickens, and I'm Vice President of Education at George Washington's Mount Vernon. And I'm so pleased to be here and to bring um, a little uh, George Washington to this event. Um, we're really excited at Mount Vernon um, for entering what we call the age of anniversaries. Um, that will be, um, I feel like this is a, a starting moment for us, uh, an opportunity to mark the Fairfax Resolves as this critical moment. Um, I love the idea of um, the unknowns, the risks uh, that were happening at this moment 250 years ago. On this day, you know, at this spot, I don't know if anybody's taken a deep breath. Breathe in that history. <laughs> it's really to be a part of just this event, to be sharing and, and to be connecting over all of those years is just thrilling. Um, and to see um, the impact of these two men, George Washington and George Mason, working together to create this document that, that really crystallized the colonists' rationale for independence, um, that created um, a pathway for ideas to travel. Two years may not seem very far away for us, for those of us thinking about the semi-quincentennial, I had to practice too, um, coming in two years, but that's a long time for these ideas to travel from George Mason and George Washington to the culmination of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Perhaps it felt like a long time, or perhaps it felt like a second for them um, in terms of the pace in which these revolutions move. Um, I'm really excited to spend the next two hours telling you about this history. <laughs> and I have all of these remarks prepared, but then I realized that um, you might want to hear from the men themselves. So let me pause my remarks, sit down, and introduce George Mason and George Washington. Many of you who know me, either personally uh, or by reputation, know that I am quite reticent and reserved. But as I convey to you the narrative of the events that led to those that you call the Fairfax Resolves, I am going to warm to my subject, and you are going to catch more than a glimpse of that side of me that only my intimates were familiar with, my intimates familiar with the passion it was a time that did not admit of reticence and reserve. Our brethren to the north in the town of Boston were suffering grievously under what were called or referred to as the coercive acts in Great Britain, but the intolerable acts here in the colonies, for they were indeed intolerable. To close down the port of Boston to change the government. Martial law instituted in the colony of Massachusetts. The judicial system essentially effaced. And what were we in Fairfax, the county of Fairfax, and the colony of Virginia to do? You see that in the Fairfax Resolves. We resolve to help, aid, and assist the good people of the town of Boston and the colony of Massachusetts. For what the British could do to the people of Massachusetts, they could very well do here in the colony of Virginia and elsewhere, correct? Yes? And it was something for which we were not about to stand. 
ministerial vengeance had been visited upon the people of Massachusetts, trying to render them prostrate, supine, so as to have complete power and authority over them. And once again, to repeat, if that could be done in the colony of Massachusetts, it could be done here in the colony of Virginia, as well as any one or more of the other 11 colonies. Now, abler heads, such as that of Mr. Mason, Colonel Mason here. Colonel Mason was one of those who was able to plumb the depths. I would also say that Dr. Franklin was another. To plumb the depths and examine any subject and render it understandable to the great mass people, including me. Those intolerable acts, those coercive acts, remember the Sugar Act of 1764, the Stamp Act of 1765. We were so busy, many of us, toasting to the health of King George III in the wake of repeal of the Stamp Act. Many did not pay attention to the Declaratory Act of 1766, the Parliament asserting its right, its authority, to tax these colonies in all cases whatsoever. An ominous sign of things to come, indeed. And then Charles Townsend, Chancellor of the Exchequer, 1767, he was determined to make those of us in the colonies pay our fair share of the cost of defending these colonies and the cost of the French and Indian War, as it was known here in the colonies, the Seven Years' War. Because Great Britain, as many of you know, ran up a not insubstantial debt in prosecuting that war against France. Our fair share. We had taxed ourselves through the Burgesses. We had grown accustomed to governing ourselves. You have heard that expression, salutary neglect. Over 150 years of salutary neglect. And then when the government, our lordly masters in Great Britain, they decide to assert their power and authority after having so long not done so, what is to be expected with respect to reaction? So they repeal the Townsend duties, but leave a tax on tea in place. For as King George III himself said, we must maintain the principle that we have the power and authority to tax. And make no mistake about it, representation and taxation are inextricably linked. Thank you. The Parliament has no more right had no more right to put its hand into your pocket or my pocket as I have to put into Mr. Mason's pocket for money. Taxation with representation, that's a whole other story, but we were not represented. We represented ourselves in the Burgesses. We had our own legislative body. But that tax on tea, as you well know, was left in place. A nothing tax wasn't the fact that it was so paltry, so minimal. It was the principle of the thing as King George III himself understood, well understood. Now, I think I may safely speak for Colonel Mason and myself when I say that we do not condone, we did not condone, we do not condone the destruction of private property with respect to the tea. It was dumped in December of 1773. But the reaction on the part of those in Great Britain was wholly out of proportion to what had been done. Condemning the people of a town, a city essentially, and a whole colony for the acts of a relative few, that cannot be tolerated. And so we resolved to help the people of the town of Boston and the colony of Massachusetts in a number of ways. We were even willing to help defray the cost of the tea to do what the ministry said it expected. We'll open the port of Boston if the tea is paid for and if Mr. Hancock and Mr. Samuel Adams are handed over. Well, you can pay for the tea, but I didn't think 
that the people of Boston were going to hand over Mr. Samuel Adams and Mr. John Hancock, as they did, in fact, not do so. To lend them, to render them help, aid, and assistance in any way, and to assert our rights as Englishmen and Englishwomen. We believed it was Great Britain who was moving away from tradition and that we were maintaining the traditional rights of Englishmen and Englishwomen. Mr. Mason had explained to me that the towns and duties and other acts of legislation were subversive of English precedent and the English Constitution. So I came to believe that and do believe that wholeheartedly. And now, Colonel Mason, with the particulars, a few thoughts. <laughs> I am not quite so elegant uh, in speech as my neighbor, but I shall try to explain what we had to go through. The English Constitution, which grew out of uh, rebellion of the people of England to the king's predations, specifically states, and you can see it currently in their government, the House of Commons. These are men elected to represent the people of England. Our House of Commons was called the House of Burgesses. And I have never desired any public activity. I am a farmer. I have much to do. But I was convinced by Colonel Washington to do my duty, to use the wits to use the power that I have for the good of my people. And at a time of my life, after my wife had died, I was much a hermit. And he convinced me to do my duty and to take a seat in the House of Burgesses, which I did. That helped me personally but I feel the need I have to help. Noblesse oblige. If we have the capacity and the ability, I owe it to my fellow man to use that. The predations of the British Parliament, we have our own representative government. We do not have representatives in the British Parliament. And they are taxing us they are punishing us. And these things are completely intolerable. We cannot live with that. And so I was asked to use some of my knowledge of history and uh, my ability to write to come up with these resolves. And basically, they all come back to that same subject. Parliament is not our government, and yet the king is supporting this. We are loyal Englishmen. The king should be protecting us, and he has become a predator. What are we to do? We have very few options or alternatives. This is being forced on us. And so we wrote these. And just months before, I wrote the uh, resolves for Prince William County. And you'll find counties all over Virginia doing the same. You'll find counties in, in the other uh, uh, colonies doing the same. So we are hoping with this massive amount of resistance that the king may come to his senses. However, I fear he may never see any of these documents. I fear that if he did, he might not agree with it. This is leaving us very few alternatives, none of which are pleasant. 
And so it was with a heavy heart that uh, we engaged in this and wrote these resolves and made sure that all were in agreement. These resolves were not dealt with until we met and everyone signed the resolves in agreement. So this is something that we have to do together and it is something very important. We hope this can straighten things out, but I have a great fear that it will not. I appreciate you uh, listening to what I have to say, and I hope you will uh, also read these resolves as they are published, and I hope you will be in agreement with what we are doing. Thank you very much. So many thanks to Brian Hilton, who portrays George Washington, and Don McAndrews, who portrays George Mason. Thank you. The Military District of Washington is proud to present the United States Army Old Guard Fife and Drum Corps. Since 1960, the Corps has carried on the Army's tradition of excellence, acting as the official escort to the President of the United States. The Corps wears uniforms patterned after those of General George Washington's Continental Army. In order to be easily identified, military musicians wore the reverse color of their parent infantry unit. At that time, American infantry soldiers wore blue coats with red facings. Thus, the musicians wore red coats with blue facings. During the Revolutionary War, sounds of the fife, bugle, and drum could be heard across the battlefield as brave soldiers fought for our nation's independence. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce the United States Army Old Guard Fife and Drum Corps, led by Sergeant First Class Aaron Morgan, Drum Major.
gentlemen, the United States Army Old Guard Fife and Drum Corps. And as we conclude our program, I invite up to the podium to invite us to the marker dedication, one of our town founders, John Carlisle. Gentlemen and ladies, rest assured I'm not going to make another commentary on the results. I rather I'm here, it's my privilege and pleasure to invite all of you that would like to observe and participate in the dedication ceremony for the monument to join me and all the others across the street, just follow the uh, honor guard here to my house and stand and watch the event. Thank you for being here. Welcome everyone to the Carlisle House and thank you Mr. Carlisle for hosting us this evening. My name is Sean Kumar. I'm a lifelong Alexandrian. I'm the chairman of the Nova Parks Board, and I'm also a major in the Army Reserve, formerly the regimental judge advocate of the Old Guard. So it's great to see the Fife and Drum Corps here this evening, and it had special meaning for me to be here with you all. The resolve was the start of what became the American Revolution. Because of preservation efforts here in Old Town, we have more than just the knowledge of the resolve. We have the places that bear witness to that event and many others. Nova Parks has been a partner with the city of Alexandria in preserving our shared past for over 50 years. The anniversary was actually yesterday. We restored the Carlisle House and continue to make major investments so this site can serve the public. As we unveil this marker about the resolve, let's also celebrate the great investment both the city of Alexandria and Nova Parks continue to make in the, plateness, the places that witnessed our country's founding. If you will, Ms. Fiorina. Fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for bearing with me. Um, we're going to invite people to come up and take pictures um, in, in different groups. Um, and we have our photographer with us, Jeff Hancock, and we'll be sure to share these images with you. I would also invite you, after you've taken some pictures, to enjoy our history booths. Make sure you get your pocket Fairfax results from the Fairfax History Commission. And enjoy a fantastic evening in Old Town. And if you're joining us for the VIP reception, uh, the check-in is at the garden gate. So thank you so much for sharing this special moment with us, the 250th anniversary of the Fairfax Resolves. This is the place where it happened. So thank you for joining us, and I look forward to sharing other semi-quincentennial events with you throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. Thank you.